Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. When we meet somebody who's deep into addiction, most of the time we don't give him any chance. We don't want to be connected with these people. We don't believe they can overcome this or come out of that addiction. And we would rather not even deal with their problem. We try to avoid these people. We try to put them on the side. As society, we try to forget about them and we try to ignore them as much as possible. Is there a chance for these people? Can they be recovered? Can they be restored? Can they come out of the darkness into a light and rebuild their lives, rebuild a family, children? Is that possible? Well, tonight you're going to hear the story of Jacob Hill. He was one of those and uh, he was in probably the deepest of the deep and uh, with no chance, zero chance, below zero chance. And yet the Lord had mercy on him. Tonight we have the privilege of hearing his story. Welcome to Kingdom Stories from Nalanda. No, a pleasure. Thanks for having me. How many people have given up on you? Everybody, except for my mum, I think. She probably did as well, but she didn't say it. No, she's, no, no I think she never gave up. She's a, she's a woman of faith. She, I think she always sort of knew God would do something or hoped. <laughs> but yeah. most, most other people have given up. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. It's even, like, I'm sure we'll get there, and then um, when I headed down to Teen Challenge to go to rehab, eventually, yes, um, the my stepdad was like, you know, give him two weeks. The staff that yeah. interviewed me said he'll, you know, <laughs> we won't make the week. And was that even, yeah, so even the zero, apart from mum, there wasn't many people that, that actually thought I'd get through. Well, there's not too many good stories out there, is there? Um, not, not in, not in contrast to the bad stories. No, that's for sure. Yeah. I didn't, I'd never heard of anybody before. Yeah. I, yeah. That's bad. Yeah. When did it all start for you? So you were born in a Christian family. Your mum was always a woman of faith. Uh, no, my parents, uh, came to faith when I was about two. So, and then they came out of a similar sort of scene. Okay. Um, and, but I was, I was raised in a Christian family, yeah, like yeah. strict, um, you're very strict. Very, in Perth? Uh, yeah, yeah, we grew up in Perth. We moved over to Perth when I was uh, three. I think I had my third birthday here. Where were you from born? From Sydney. Okay. And um, yeah, and again, just grew up all I knew was church. and. What church did your parents go to at the um, time? It was, it was what's now Metro. Okay, in the city? Yeah, with Pastor Jeff, okay. Jeff Woodward. Um, we're still good friends of ours and we keep in touch. Yeah. It was a great church. Yeah. I say. Um, Did you live in the city or nearby? Uh, we were in Belmont. Okay. So not far. Yeah. Like yeah. 10 minutes or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How many brothers and sisters? So I've got two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. And my dad's since remarried. And I've got a younger sister who's much younger than us. So she's like. So your parents split up? Yeah. yeah. How old were you? So I would have been 12, 13 when that happened. Okay. About 13, I'd say. And what caused that? Um, There's probably a bit more to it than, than just that, but ultimately it was my dad um, was running around with my mum and mm-hmm. she just, you know... Gave up. Yeah, drew the line and said no. And, um, yeah, that was... that. That's why it ended. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So until then, life was pretty good at home? Yeah, life was brilliant. Like, it was, you know, we... My, my parents had been studying through my primary school years, yeah. so we didn't have much in the way of money and things, but we didn't go without. What were they studying? Um, my mum's a school teacher, yeah. and my dad's a nurse. Okay. He was a nurse. Um, so, yeah, medicine and teaching. And, yes, yeah, so it was great. Like, we would go camping all the time, fishing, church every Sunday. Yeah. And my dad would take us to practice, played sport, played hockey. Takes to practice each week. Grass and, hockey or ice hockey? Field hockey, yeah. Field hockey. yeah. Proper okay. hockey. Proper <laughs> hockey. The real thing. <laughs> if you're in Canada, you yeah, I was going to say, Perth is not, not much of a... Uh, there's not much... Not Have much. you played at Curtin? On? Uh, yeah, yeah, I played it. I, I trained there 
Uh, I used to train there twice a week. I played there. I was 12 years old playing there on the Saturday. Wow. Yeah. Great sport. Yeah, yeah, it was good fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. it was a good, fast game. And um, yeah, that was... And then, um, yeah, it was just all pretty fast. Just the whole world was tipped upside down, really, just in, in the blink of an eye. With the divorce? Yeah, with the se- we were separation. The divorce happened later, yeah. but yeah. initially the... Um, so the, this was you're about twelve thirteen, which is a yeah, critical. Oh, age. extremely critical. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how many young people you come across, and that's where their parents got separated. It's like, yeah. You sort of think, gosh, if you could pick any worse time. Yeah. Like there is. Well, it's a passage to manhood. It's and you're probably most vulnerable at that age. Yeah. Well, you're figuring out who you are. You're figuring out where you belong. You're figuring you are changing already yeah. yeah and then you and i think having a dad around is critical to help yeah. you navigate that identity yeah and you know that passage to manhood to initiate you sure. and bring you along and um even teach you correct you yeah that sort of stuff but at that same time um so i'd gone to high school on a sports scholarship i was a champion boy for athletics right through school I was wow. like boys. yeah and then my but i developed a disease in my knees and mm. i couldn't run so in a really short space of time, it was just yeah, everything. Well, that hurt as well. Yeah, so I was going to the Olympics. That was my, my dream was... What, like, in what? Uh, hockey. Hockey. Yeah, okay. I was like, right, I'm, there was no ifs or buts. I was going to win a gold medal for Australia. Hallelujah. I was just like locked in. And like I was saying, I used to train at the uh, Commonwealth Hockey Stadium four times a week. I'd train there. Yeah. And I'd play. And this is a 12-year-old boy. Amazing. Yeah, and I'm playing there on the weekends and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so try, yeah, it was just I thought I was on my way. Yeah, like I, you know, I knew I was faster than anybody else, so yeah. I, that could buy me a bit of, you know, yeah. yeah and but it didn't happen. And but yeah, so really, what happened is like home became hell. Dad left, mum, you know, just devastated. Did mum lose it? Oh, wouldn't say lose it, but whatever's she was in her back. Nah, she changed. Depression. Nah, she just got hard. Mm-hmm. Probably depression, yeah, actually looking back. Um, the thing that came across to us was she got hard, like just really... Tough. Yeah, but I don't think that was all to do with my dad. I think that would have been a combination of that plus at pretty much at that same juncture, uh, we, me and my brothers just went, you know... like I, the, Against her as well. Yeah, yeah, we were terrible. Yeah, we were horrible. I remember, um, so I always loved going to church. I, I, yep. I was, I don't, know, I don't know if I was a spiritual kid in the sense I didn't realize I was, yeah, yeah. but I loved church. I loved God. Yep. I love, you know, all of it. Um, the only sort of drag was a bit was you couldn't sleep at your mate's house on a Saturday night. Yeah. Or if they could sleep at your house and then come to church, so that was cool. They would come along, my friends would, sure. you know, but, um, but I enjoyed it, but my brothers were less so, but, um, I don't know if your house is the same as my house and everybody else's house I spoke about. Sunday mornings can be a bit of a, you know, a bit hectic. Yeah. You know, where seems to be a fight brewing or argument, just like. Just before church. Yeah. And um, one, so it was just my mum and me and my brothers were, I was just getting ready. My brothers were fighting about something. And then um, my older brother comes to me. He's like, Jacob, just tell mum we don't want to go to church anymore. Yeah. There's a little bit more of a backstory. I'd, Pulled a knife on a kid oh. in Sunday school. <laughs> As you do. That's where I was at. That, you know, <laughs> so I was still in that place. I was like, you know, so I didn't... From the toy box. More about the toy box, but <laughs> from my pocket, because I'd, I'd already started to hang out with these guys. Do, you know, I was already like, things had already gotten pretty Nasty. chaotic. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't think I'd started using drugs yet, yeah. but, but I was hanging out with the guys that were getting involved in the gang scene and so all this was stuff. on on the streets on or belmont Vic park? yeah belmont Vic park yeah. around there yeah um and then um so i that had happened and i realized i did something dumb i'm like oh. and so i thought oh, if i just try and avoid going to church for a few weeks maybe it blows over yeah you know it'd been a couple of weeks and then my brother he's like tell mom we don't want to go to church anymore yeah and i remember going out i was just like i remember thinking about it. it's like i like going to church but if I go back, I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble. Because of what I did. Yeah. And then um, I was thinking also, it means I get like a whole nother day to my weekend. So I was like, I went out to my mum. She's like, hurry up, get ready, get in the car, we're going to church. 
And I, and I said to her, I was like, Mum, I really want to thank you for bringing us up with your values. Yeah. Um, and bringing us, you know, I said, but we don't believe in your God. <laughs> this is, I, I wasn't, I didn't, yeah. I was just, yeah. Like, <laughs> just, just to get out of God. It's like, we don't believe in your God and we don't want to go to church anymore. And um, that was actually the moment where she turned. So I think from that, coupled with what my dad, my dad leaving, yeah, and then she would have probably just saw it as the whole family, just you know. And from that moment on, she got just pretty hard. She was still amazing, like she she did her best, but of course, she three, well, she was hurt as well, and that would have hurt her as well. He gutted her, yeah. And she had like three teenage boys, and it was just. What did she say in that moment? Do you remember? No, it's nothing. She, she cried. And, well, she she just turned and walked off. I couldn't hear anything, but I, I'm pretty sure she was crying. Yeah, like you know, the shoulders are sort of moving up and down a bit. I'm like, oh. And then, as the front my mind frame I was in was just like, oh, put it at the back of the brain and go on and have fun and try not to think about. Yeah. You know. So you just uh, nullified it. Yeah. Yeah. Numbed it and carried on. Yeah. 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 And uh, alcohol started, or yeah, all the around that same time, like um, started binge drinking and smoking cigarettes. Um, but ma- well, marijuana was the big one, and but I did have. Remember the first time I tried pot, thinking, if this is how good pot is. See, because so I, I like all the drug. We've got amazing drug education in schools, and and you learn, you know, all the stuff, and but the message I got was don't do drugs they're bad that was the my yeah. takeaway yeah from it all and then I've tried pot not because I was curious not because for any reason except for I wanted to fit in with my mates yeah and um so what I figured is I'd try it I wouldn't like it because you know drugs are bad drugs yeah. are stupid don't do all of that stuff yeah I'm not going to like it and then next time the bomb gets passed to me no I don't like it no worries it's not that I'm a chicken I haven't tried yeah. or anything like that and I've tried it and remember the first time I, I, I tried it I really I, I, I did feel like I fit it in yeah but the other thing was is I got stoned and I really liked it like yeah. I really liked being high like I remember feeling like the first time I smoked pot was wow if I can just keep feeling like this everything will be okay yeah and I'd never been prepared for a positive experience you know sure like I'd, I'd um, the other side the next thought I had was if this is how good pot is I wonder how good all the other drugs are yeah and I just lost it yeah yeah I just sort of went crazy and this would have been 14, 15 13 13 13 yeah and very was, very young yeah, yeah yeah looking back I didn't I didn't think anything of it at the time so was it just pot or you started with with uh, oh so I started speed with speed or well yeah well, that was what I thought was like well this is how good pot is I wonder how you know <laughs> and then I just yeah, speed, ecstasy, acid, a lot of acid, um, a lot of binge drinking, um, and that sort of stuff. And that Heroin? One, not uh, yet. Well, not really, not not injecting it. Maybe like a little bit every now and again on your pot, which yeah. I didn't really even know about really. Um, but no, not yet. Yeah. No, that was about 16. When and I was. You, you still went to school? Ish. On and off? Well, I was there. I failed everything from... Like year eight was the last year of school I passed. Yeah. Um, I've was it common in the school? There were quite a few kids with that, or yeah, yeah, it was rife through that school. Like which it, school is this? Uh, it was Como. Uh, so it's called Como Secondary College now. Yeah. So, even that, though it was quite an affluent, I, I actually place. think that had a part of it because they had money, had money, they could yeah. buy. So what had really happened is it was getting worse and worse. And my brother's year, who's the year ahead of me, was just like the volcano went off. Like they were shooting heroin in the, like in the bathrooms and oh, yeah. like. And your brother was in it as well. Yeah, he was in part of all that. And then they just started to expel kids. Yeah. And then, um, and then my year there was a bit of a residual sort of, you yeah. guys are connected to that. But then I just think they cleaned house and really changed the culture in the school. So like now it doesn't have that reputation. So did you, were you expelled? Uh, yeah, you... yeah, I was expelled from, um, from that school. I moved to another school and I was expelled from there. And that was, so I finished in year 11. Because of academics or because of trouble or because of drugs or? Um, 
Well, so the last day of year 11, I lit up a cigarette in class and sort of walked out. Yeah. And then I got called into the principal's office and they said, don't come back. Yeah. So, yeah, every, I wasn't doing my work. I was using drugs. Was you were gripped, basically. There was, oh, yeah. You didn't yeah. care about anything no, or anybody. No. You, you were in your own head, yeah. in your own space. No, just totally self-absorbed, yeah. Girls? Um, no. Like, never, well, never a steady girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Like, um, parties and all that stuff, that stuff would go on. But I, I, I didn't, <laughs> what I actually thought, if there's anyone who would want to go out with me, I thought I'd have to have serious mental health issues. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so like, you knew, you knew. Oh, I knew, I knew I was off the wall, yeah. yeah. But also probably really low self-esteem. Were you hiding it or not really? Or oh, couldn't care? No, I didn't care. Okay. Not, not by that point. I was yeah. pretty... So how were you living? How Were you still living at home? Um, so when my mum... My mum knew that we'd be going... You know, my parents had tried to work together to help us get off it, work it all out and stuff. Um, like when they caught us smoking pot for the first time, they took us down to the police station, took a, you know, and... Um, Surrendered your gear. Yeah, yeah. And then... Um, but I mean, this is how, how much that affected us. My brother gave him half, put half in his pocket, and after they dropped us back at school, we smoked the rest of the pot before going back into class. So, yeah. But they, they locked, tried. They should have locked you up. Yeah. So what actually happened was... Um, you know, they wanted him to. They're like, give these guys a scare. Like, do... and the... But, um, so I've, I've gone like that. They tried. But I think I was 17... And um, my mum, what, what, what happened to eventually the tipping point was um, my mum had basically said, had, oh, that's actually what happened. She said, you need to choose between drugs and me. Yeah. She said, you need to choose. Yeah. And I I, 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 like, I was like, you're saying ripped. I, I, I apologised to her. I said, sorry. I, I'll take drugs. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had to move out. Which wasn't as clean as that, an exit as that, but. So where did you go? Um, With went, mates. No, no. Initially, I went to my dad's and then to mates. Um, Were you working? No. Oh well. No. No short answer. I, I had a job for a little while. Um. But. Yeah. It, Crime stealing. Oh yeah. So a lot of selling and stealing. Selling, selling drugs, drugs obviously. Stealing, yeah. And stealing whatever computers, phones, whatever yeah, you could, tools. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just whatever was easy. Robbery from, from the houses or yeah, some some yeah, sometimes that, sometimes like arm robbery and robbing, you know, drug dealers and yeah, just, just in the nasty, yeah, just any like. Were you threatened? Uh, was your life at risk? Oh, different times. Not from the drugs. I'm talking from other people. Yeah, different right? times. Not not too often, but you know, yeah, every now and again, people would, like serious people would try to stand over you and. Did you get bashed up and? No. Um, no, I was never really on the receiving end of much. A lot of the giving side you of it. You could still, you could still run. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't worried about. No, no, that was. Um, no, there was a lot of that stuff going on, but not. <laughs> I wasn't the one yeah. being hurt generally. Yeah, yeah. So there was. No gel yet. No, no, no. That's. Um, I think I got out just in time. Okay. So yeah, well, when I so when I made the decision to go to team like to go to rehab i was 21 mm-hmm. my mum said so i hadn't lived at home for years or yeah. just but she said um i don't want to talk to you again until you're in rehab mm-hmm. like to really understand it i didn't have her phone number i didn't know where she like where she lived that yeah. she was you know just trying to but anyway she said that and i've um gone down to um, to Teen Challenge, what was now called Adult and Teen Challenge, and, and I've started my new life. My friend that I was living with... Who introduced you to a Teen Challenge? Oh, that, that's a funny story. Um, so the, well, the friend I was living with, he, he basically has been in jail for most of the time since. Yeah. So, um, so, I'm at, at, so I've gone... That exact thing my mum said, I don't want to talk to you again until you're in rehab. So yes. I'm like, fine, I think rehab doesn't work. Yeah. Once a junkie, always a junkie. I thought, but for you, I'll give it a go. Yeah. It's not going to work. Yeah. And my plan then was go somewhere, detox for a little bit, come back, feel drugs again because I couldn't feel them anymore. Yeah. Um, and then just go nuts and just 
just drive myself into the ground. But so I'm at this place and I've gone there. My, my normal lady's there. She's like saying, oh, you can't get into rehab. You're using way too much drugs mm-hmm. to... I was using too much drugs to go into the detox clinic. Yeah. Because you've got to go there before you go into the rehab. Okay. But I was using too much to even go into the detox clinic. <laughs> you didn't qualify. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, does this even work? And they're like, well, you need to get... You use less so you can get to the detox clinic so you can get medically detox so you can go to... I'm thinking, if I could do yeah. that, I wouldn't need you people. Yeah. I wouldn't be here if I could. And anyway, so like that went on for a little bit and then they're just there like, I don't even really remember much. And then I've gone in one time, they maybe had two or three visits. And I've at, gone at in. Esperance? No, no, this is in Perth, in the okay. city. This yep. is all to do with trying to get into a rehab okay. because my mum said, rehab or don't talk to me. But you were skinny. Uh, no, it wasn't too bad. I was like, I was living in a nice two-story house. Oh, so you weren't on the streets. Oh, no, no, no. We were, you lived the life. Yeah, we're doing okay. okay. For, I mean, not like, yeah, yeah. but was for 17-year-old, like, 20 year old kids were doing good um and then so then this one lady comes like i've gone in there my normal lady's not there and um i'm like i've just literally said oh no i'll just come back next week when my normal lady's here and she's yeah. like she, she said oh my um the normal counselor she w- wasn't there that day and she was filling in from the outside yeah and then i'm thinking you know don't worry about it she's like oh, no no why aren't you here now you know why don't we try and help you and I thought, oh, hang on, this lady doesn't know my story. I might be able to con her. Yeah. So she's asked me, you know, I've started to get to know me. I've told her I'm using hardly any drugs, you know, so I can get, <laughs> get into rehab. And, yeah. You know. And then um, and then she said, oh, I think Teen Challenge would be really good for you. And then I've just remembered, like, years earlier, hearing Jade Lewis, I don't know if you've, you know, have you heard of someone yeah. sharing that they'd been to Teen Challenge and it was God place. Yeah. God had helped them get off heroin. Yeah. And I was at the back of this thing because I was with my mum. My mum was a school teacher. It was at something uh, right near my house. Yeah. So I was like, and I'm like, BS. Yeah. It's like, you never, I mean, once a junkie, always a junkie. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm saying this as loud as I'm saying it to you. My mum's there. Yeah. Massive big orders <laughs> full of people. Like this little thug. Like, and I'm like, BS. She either, you know, like she either never had a proper habit or she yeah. still got a closet habit. Like, yeah. that was it. I'm like, no, nah, no way. And then anyway, so years later, this lady says, I think Teen Challenge would be really good for you. Yes. Because that's right. She said, oh, do you smoke? I'm like, mm, no. Nah. <laughs> Just thinking, what else? Lie through my teeth, whatever, to get this lady to get me into somewhere. And then, um, and then she says Teen Challenge. And I remember this girl sharing her story and God was involved. And I'm like, are you a Christian? Are you trying to push God on me? She's like, no, no, no. We'll find you somewhere else. But I was like, in that little split second, that little split second between me saying, you're trying to push God on me and her saying, no, there's no time. And that's yeah. whatever that was. I'm like, oh, I need a miracle. So I didn't want to stop. Yes. I knew I needed to. Yeah. I didn't want to. Yeah. Like, it was all I'd known from like 13, I was 21 now. Like, my whole, I didn't even know anything apart from it. I'm like, God, if you're real, you can make me stop wanting to use drugs. Mm. I said, if you do that, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. She's like, no, 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 we'll find you somewhere else. We'll find you somewhere else. I'm like, nah, give me the God place. She's like, no, no, we'll find you somewhere else. I'm like, lady, give me the God place. <laughs> and I don't, I don't remember much, but then I've ended up, yeah, on a bus down to Esperance. Okay. So, yeah, that was the... Oh, I guess better, though. That lady, she didn't exist. So I've gone back the next week and I've told my regular ladies there, and I'm like, oh, I want to go to Teen Challenge. And she's like, no, you don't want to go there. <laughs> it's, it's really strict. You won't fit in there at all yeah. and all of this stuff. And I'm like, no, that's what I want. No, I don't want to talk to you. Give me the lady that was here last week. There was no one here last week. And she's, yeah. And she's like, what do you mean? Because um, she was sick. The, and I said, she said she was from the outside. And um, like that you were sick, so she'd come in from the outside. And she, then she's like, we don't get people from the outside. And her face has gone pale. And she's got walked straight out. Walked around asking everybody. Who was here? Yeah, she's come back in like I was crazy, like that never Angel. Happened. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, but I didn't think anything of it then. Yeah. I thought these people are all crazy. Like, I was, <laughs> <you> <laughs> <know>. Sphinx. <laughs> yeah, I know. But yeah, looking back, I was just like, whoa. And when the penny really dropped for me is when I started working for Teen Challenge. Afterwards. In, yeah, years and years later. But I'm working in the office yeah. doing the same stuff she was doing. Yeah. You don't get someone to come. It's like you're on a pastoral yeah. team here. You know, someone's sick. You don't get, you know, it's not like school where you sure, get you don't bring somebody relief in. teacher. 
And yeah. that's when the pennies dropped on me. I was like, whoa. It's a miracle. Full on miracle, man. Yeah. Full on miracle. So you're going to the Teens Challenge, right? Uh, you still, you, you call Turkey now. Yeah, yeah, because I lied through my teeth to get there. Okay. Yeah. So when you landed, when, when you arrived at Esperance, <laughs> so first night was no worries. I'd, I'd spent the night up awake before. Yeah. Just slept know. on the bus all the way there, well, 12 hours. <laughs> not, not really, but it was like last hurrah the night before. So not really, bro, yeah. but you know, just pretty much a typical night, really. But, you know, did a decent job of it. Then my friend who was doing a decent job of it with me drove me to the bus station. East Perth. Yeah. Which look back and think, anyway, <laughs> the condition that people would drive in. Dropped me there. And I've caught the bus down to Esperance. You know, got to like, you know, got there and thought, oh. so camp hope. Yeah. Well, no. Well, see, because actually, that's where it really turned for me, though. So I've gone this this bus ride, thinking doesn't work. Three weeks yeah. tolerance down because I couldn't even feel drugs anymore by now. It was yeah. just just so I didn't get sick and just so I. Yeah. I mean, I could feel it a little bit, but not it not high. No, it wasn't high. And um, so that's my plan going in, like whatever. And then not really knowing what to expect. Then this little Vietnamese guy, but I knew it was a Christian place. I yeah. knew it was a churchy place. And I was thinking if anything's going to happen, that's where it's going to happen. Yeah. But by then I'd, re- re- you know, probably recanted all of that. And, yeah. But then this little Vietnamese guy, clean cut church boy looking guy comes and picks me up. I'm thinking, oh, what a waste of my time. What a, you know, I think this guy looks like he's never even had a pen at all. It's like, how can he help me? But then on this bus ride, I'm getting talking to this guy. He was in like the Vietnamese gangs and like a heroin dealer. And he knew all the, you know, we knew the same people. And it was just yeah. like, but to look at him, you would never have a clue he ever had a habit. Yeah. Like, and when you're in that scene, you know, you look at people and you know, like still yeah. now, I look at people and I know. Yeah. Like this person's got a habit. That person's the eyes. Dead. Yeah. There's something. Fidgety. There's yeah. Just the, even spiritual. Sp- I think it's quite spiritual. Yeah. But, you know, there's a saying like an addict knows an addict. Like yeah. where I haven't, would not classify myself as an addict now, but I still know it. Yeah. This guy, there's nothing on him. No. He wasn't like, I'm looking at him thinking, you're not an addict. Yeah. And you were and you're not. <laughs> Thinking, so it's possible. This could work, yeah. Yeah. So it was actually that first day, that first afternoon night, that I actually you talk about Camp Hope. Yeah. <laughs> Hope hit then. I was like, wow, this this could work. Yeah. I was sick as a dog, like really, really sick from the detoxing and yeah. everything. Didn't sleep for so long, like maybe an hour or two. Nightmares. Ah, uh, no, not really. Vomit. Um, no. Sweats, cold sweats. Sweats and like cramps and just summer? on the floor. Winter in Esperance. Oh, and they don't give you much heating. You can't have heating nah, in the room. No, yeah. It was cold <laughs> yeah. there. Though. Well, it was all right. And you, well, yeah. it didn't matter. Like, like, it. I was just freezing. Like I'd just drop on the floor, cramping up, dripping with sweat, like freezing yeah. cold. Like it was just... Obviously, they had seen this before. So for them, it was normal. You yeah. had to go through it. Yeah, well, like... <laughs> passage into yeah. into teen challenge yeah like it, that sort of shape wasn't ultra common yeah but they would have seen it different yeah. times yeah it's like it happens but like not normally that bad yeah so but yeah and then the, it took me months before I got a proper sleeping pattern back yeah and it was, um, cause I was eating bit, healthy sleeping well yeah well the eating was come back was pretty they feed you well yeah but well, um, they have to because I mean you you're in such a messed up, you know, state that you need you need food and rest basically. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, you're dealing with some people that have pretty whacked sort of metabolic metabolisms and sleeping yeah. patterns and like I had been living in this weird sort of thirty six hour day. Yeah. Where it sort of be that's if I wasn't using amphetamines. Yeah. So a typical day would be, you get up when you can't sleep anymore. Yeah. Like you cannot squeeze another drop of sleep in. Yeah. Get up, stay awake. So then start using drugs and doing all. For things. as long as you can. Well, this because yeah, yeah, you'd like busy and then. Day and night didn't matter. No, nah, didn't. It was just like when you run out of stuff to do, yeah. then you go to bed. Yeah. When you go to bed, you sleep for as long as you can. Yeah. And it was. And then if you're using amphetamines, you might be awake for a few days at a time. Yeah. Some of the guys would be awake for weeks at a time. I was never. That was never really my thing. So. 
was after a few days I'd be like, oh, leave you guys to it. I'm <laughs> going do crushing. This. Yeah, going um, but yeah, it was this weird. So that was had been my life for what five years by that point. I, mm. <laughs> there was no sleep pattern at all. Plus the fact is I'd never go to bed straight. You'd yeah. always like I used to if I woke up in the middle of the night. I would smoke some pot to go back to sleep. Yeah. Like, it was very rare you would ever go to bed without drugs in your system. Yeah. So that was one of the hardest things, was learning so how to sleep at, again. So, at the end challenge, no drugs? No. Nobody could sneak them in? Oh, you could. Well, yeah, you could. Like, you got, you're dealing with these people that can do anything. Yeah. But I thought, well, why do it there? I thought, if I want to use... Yeah, if I want you to were use, there for a purpose. I thought, if I want to use drugs, I'll go back to Perth. the party house I was living and use all the drugs I want. Yeah. Like, um, that decision I made really early on, and I think that was pretty key to the, the real, just the um, the radical sort of transformation, really. Yes. So I remember um, very, very early on, I'm talking the first few days, day or two even, someone offered me a cigarette. Yes. Um, and I was just like, no, nah, I'm done with this. Like, I'm, you know, and pretty much from then, I'd say I was probably delivered from addiction that minute like that wow. second it's just that decision it was just and God honoured it and it was just done so were you getting into the religious practices there in the the worship <laughs> and bits and pieces like that uh, eventually Devotionals. yeah eventually like well not even take too long um, at first especially during the detox because the chapels every morning sure except for Saturday you've got chapel every morning and a church on a Sunday I was not sleeping really bad like detoxing and then the worship team is all happy clappy and I'm like I remember looking at the back just death staring these guys I'm like <laughs> just trying to you know yeah but um and then you've got this the the face work where you've got the books and you like it's it, it's they call it Bible college for baddies is what yeah the, so it's very um Andrew Warmax. Uh, did you do those studies as well or no yeah I know the names from, oh, possibly I don't yeah. uh, but I remember one of them was really early on was it was almost like a choose your own adventure yeah. thing where it's like you follow the pattern if you this you want to make this decision you go into this particular study sure if you make that decision you go into this study yeah and the the where it was at the juncture in the thing was do you want to let make, or do you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life yeah and I was like oh gosh I remember I grew up going to church. You knew that. I believed in God, God, really. Yeah. I had gone there because I needed a miracle. Yes. I was like, so I knew, like, I really, I knew, in my heart of hearts, I knew I was going down there to turn my life around, to give my life to Christ, to just yeah. live the whole life. Like, I knew that. And I was like, oh, I still couldn't pull, it took me a few days to pull the trigger and write, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was, and then from that point on, I, I, I really, just dug into trying to get to know God. Did they baptize you there? Yeah, yeah. Got baptized in um, in the lake? Southern Ocean. Oh, oh no, no, down the um, Port Authority. Not in the dam. No, no, it wasn't much of a uh, lake at the time I was there. Yeah. So it's very... Um, lake Grace. Yeah, it's very... Uh, lake Success. Oh, Lake Success, is it? Yeah. It's very um, rain dependent. Uh, it's called Grace Academy or what is it? Grace called? Academy, Grace yeah. Academy, yeah. 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 Yeah, Malcolm likes his grace. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the... And how long did you spend there initially? Oh, gosh. A year and a half, too? <laughs> nah. That's for soft people. <laughs> so, <laughs> three years. Yeah, I was there for like three and a half years. So I did the program. You graduated? Yeah. And, and then, then you became a mentor? Did an internship and then became a mentor. So okay. all up, it was over three and a half years. Okay. So the program wasn't supposed to take as long as it took me. Yeah. Like at some point, I just hit a stall and just any... Like, so you're in class, and that's how you actually get regulated for your progression. Yeah. Um, and but they just any time there was someone needed to volunteer for anything, yeah, I'll oh, help. Yeah. yeah, just get me out of this classroom. I was like, okay, you didn't want to read, I didn't want to be stuck in a chair. I was just like, get me out of here. But um, yeah, that was something like I I, I read growing up a lot. Sure. Like from a strict Christian family, we didn't even have a TV, so oh. reading was my entertainment. So I, I you know, it's a good reader. But I couldn't get into the Bible. The Bible was just like most words. Boring, just, but what tiny I tiny words. Yeah, oh, yeah, tiny as well. 
But what I read a lot of testimonies. Okay. I read like a th- this, you know, and stories. Then, yeah, and then one of the testimonies was a guy, and um, it was the book was called God Spy. Mm-hmm. It was a, sort of a something to do. You know, the God Smuggler. Yeah. So it was along the lines of that. In Russia or in uh, China or. Where was it? It was Soviet Union, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, but it was along the lines of God's yeah. smuggler, so he was actually hooked up. Anyway, so this guy's, in his book, he's writing about, um, he said, someone's got, said to him, if you want to get serious about God, you need to do this Bible reading plan. Yeah. And it was like two chapters of the Old Testament, two of the New one Proverbs. One Psalms. At five Psalms. Five Psalms. So you go a through day. Pro- pro- yeah, a day. Oh, so I was like, hmm, it sounds interesting to me. That's 40 minutes. And I thought, well, but I also wanted to learn about the epistles more and the life of Jesus. So I thought, I'll do that, but instead of two, the New Testament, I'll do two of the Gospels and two of the letters. Yeah. So that, you know, because I was an ex- little extreme person. Like, yeah. you go anything, just go hard. Like, yeah. I'm like, right. And then I would just make sure no matter what, every day I'd get through that. Yes. So I did that for a couple of years and just, I didn't realize, just pumping myself full of the word. Which worked the miracle. Yeah. Yeah. It become real and you had no idea how many times I read it through. And so what happened when you finished? So you came back to town or you decided to stay? No, so I finished the program. I was uh, did an internship, um, and then I was invited on staff. So I was there for two years on, um, as part of the staff team. And then I remember one day I was like at the point where I was really in the groove. Like where when I first signed on, I sort of had a two year plan. Yeah. Well, it wasn't even my plan. My plan was I knew I was called to preach the gospel. I thought right, Bible college. Involved in the church, youth, youth pastor, pastor, go and preach the gospel to the nations. Yeah. You know? And then I felt the pull to work there. I'm like, oh. So I laid all that down, you know, um, was like a missionary there. And then um, from that, I was just there and I was, I was loving it. Like first year was hell. Yeah. Really brutal. Like, and then the second year I was in my vein. I knew what I was doing. I was yeah. like... And I thought I could do this, you know, and I, they need long-term staff there as well. Yeah. They need people that, you know, and I was like, oh, this would be really good. Um, and then they had uh, Don Wilkinson. He's the brother of David Wilkinson, the guy that wrote The Cross and the Switchblade. He yes. came down and um, I met him. I met David Wilkinson as well at a different point, but I met him and I was thinking, wow, if I keep working here and doing this, I could end up like him and really yeah. helping a lot of people. And I was really sort of, oh, yeah. Dreaming big. I'm, yeah, well, yeah, and then I was like sitting in the, the um, the tea, the lunch or the tea room for the staff, and I just felt God say, "It's time." It's just boom, it's yep. time. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, um, okay." I knew what he's talking about, going, yep. and then I sort of, you know, it wasn't a conversation, more of a prompting. It was like you, a like it was, it was just like a, like God's like, eh, and that was saying it's Nudge. time. Yeah, and then my nudge back was, well, hang on, what about all those things? Yeah. And then I just had this vision that the door was there, but then it just was completely black. Like, it was just nothing outside it. And God's like, you can stay here and I'll give you all that. Yeah. Or? He's like, or you can go out there with me. Mm. And I'm like, young, single, no commitments. Yeah. I'm like, ah, I'll take adventure every time. Sure. So I'm like, right, okay. And I've stepped out and um, got promoted, like I had, you know, an amazing opportunity to work in a warehouse for like two years. Here in Perth. Yeah, yeah. Just, just right here, Wangara. So, but it was like, um, I, I, God told me work here. Sure. I'm like, but I'm, people are offering me ministry positions. I got this call to preach the gospel. I'm like, but I knew that God said no. Like I knew God said, no, I want you to do that. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And then... Yeah, so I'm working in a warehouse for like two years, like a couple of different positions. I'm like, uh, before um, but you know, I'd, in that in that time, I'd got married. I'd started yeah. dating a girl, got married, um, serving at church. We helped start a church, the church that we're now pastor. So tell me a little bit about your wife. How did you meet her? So she was a staff member at Teen Challenge while I was a student. Okay. 
you leave out some key details, yes. you can make it sound really sordid. <laughs> so I, I had nothing to do did, with her. Did she come out of addiction as well? Yeah, she went through the program as well. So most staff that are there have come, all the mentors have come through. Some, some. Not all. No, not all. So she had been through the program, very similar background to myself. Mm -hmm. um, she was on staff. Yep. I didn't really get to know, I didn't really know her at all while I was doing the program. She was on staff while I was an intern there. Yeah. Got to know her a little bit. And then she left to, um, and, and when I started on staff. So we never really yeah. didn't actually get to know her very well at all. And then um, she was working for Teen Challenge up here in Perth. Yeah. In the main office. And so I got to know her a bit more over that time and sort of, you know, liked her, you know. Yeah. I knew it wasn't God's time or anything, so I just let it go. I thought, oh, you know, whatever. Like, yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I really liked her as a friend. Like, I thought this chick's amazing. Like, I used to pray, like, God, to give her a good husband. You know, like, you know, God, just, just get, you know, someone's going to treat her right. And, you know, all this yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. That's how spiritual and pure I was. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, probably deep down hoping it was going to be me. That was yeah. the answer to that prayer. <laughs> but you know, but I, I, I laid it down the best I could. And then, um, yeah, I finished working at Teen Challenge. And then there was like, this is where things had gotten to with us. Like there was a girl I thought I was interested in and I was like checking around asking Mel, like, what's this chick like? And all of that. And then, um, and then I, one night I was at a party, like a church party. It was yeah. like a, and um, no, it wasn't just one night. It was Christmas Eve. Uh -huh. So <laughs> this, this adds to the value of the story. Yes. Christmas Eve, I'm at this party, I corner this chick, get to know her a little bit more. And then I, I get home and then sort of just, you know, thinking about it. I was like, oh, she's all right, but she's no Melissa. Oh. And I didn't really thought, you know, I was just like, whoa. And that was my reaction as well. I was just blindsided. I was just like, whoa. Next day is Christmas Day. Yes. <laughs> so, Lunch again. Well, it was Christmas. Day. So I, I ring her up and I'm so, oh, so what are you doing? <laughs> like... <laughs> Christmas Day. She's like, oh, well, you know, going to... with the family. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. I was like, oh, did you have a minute? Um, like, I'll pop around. She's like, um, okay. Like, we were friends. We weren't, like, visit each other on Christmas friends. Yes. You know? <laughs> and then, so I've popped over there and sort of told her where, <laughs> what I thought. And you know, long story short, we got married sort of August that year. Wonderful. The following year, yeah. yeah. Not How August, did you or, not August, Sorry, uh... December. I proposed on her birthday in August. Oh, that's when beautiful. August came in. Yeah, I proposed. Um, did that she a, know? Did she feel it? Uh, that was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think she, yeah, she's pretty switched on. Where was it? Um, the Black Swan Winery in the Swan Valley. Nice. It was a nice place. Well, the, no, it wasn't. Like, it was nice, don't get me wrong, but it was like $200 dinner. Yeah. And you're like four ravioli. Like uh, this. <laughs> not even a steak. No, it wasn't even good ravioli. It was like, probably was for like fancy people, but I like, you know. Give me a, you know, pro, a full pro, dish. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, she's Italian, so like we get good ravioli with, you oh, know. Oh, now you do. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, it was, yeah, and then, so that was August. We got married by December. Yes. You know, and then a couple of years later had kids and. Um, we took over the church. You've got two kids or three? Three. So the Good. oldest will be 11 soon, two boys. They'll be yeah. 10 and 11 soon. Yeah. And the little one, just girl, she just turned six. Beautiful. So, yeah, it's pretty pretty fantastic. And you went to the Grace Church or Grace City Church? What, what's it called? So um, we started, it was called Grace Chapel. Oh, Grace Chapel. Yeah. And we, we started just going there. We helped, helped plant it, um, just sort of got involved and, you know, was chief toilet cleaner. Yeah. Which is a good place to start. And then a year later, while I was working in the warehouse, Malcolm rang me up. Yeah. And said, Do you want to come and like run the church for me? Like, so I've just, yeah. you know, from the shepherd's field, so to speak. And, yes. Um, yeah, and started, we, we took over the church then. Okay. So that was 2008. You're still there? We're still there, yeah. It's called Everyday Church now. Oh, you guys are Everyday Church? Yeah. Right? All right. Yeah. But that name only got changed, what, last year or Very two? recently, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Love the name. It's a great name, isn't it? Excellent name. Excellent. I'm amazing somebody to it. Yeah, I know. Like, how good's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw your logo on your church. It's like for, for everybody. Yeah. I was like, yeah, you're my people. Yeah. <laughs> this is, yeah. Beautiful. 
Yeah. I know a, a gentleman who comes. I don't know if he's still with you, Daniel Anthony. Is he still there? Yeah, 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 yeah. He comes. He's he's, he's a little a, baby. He's a great guy, and I've I've journeyed with him. Yeah. For a number of years, and when he married his beautiful wife, and uh, I I felt bad. I I wanted to have him in, yeah, in our church. He did. Yeah. He's such good value. He, yeah. Have you heard him preach? Do you let him preach? I didn't even know he preached. He can preach, man. Seriously? He can preach. He preached in, in our church. So he was part of our church. His family, mm. they grew up in churchlands. Okay. So he's extended family. And then, but he, he shared his heart about the ministry and about yeah. you guys. And I thought, no, man, you're in the right place. Yeah. So amazing, amazing uh, couple. Yeah, right. Yeah, they are good. Yeah, he... Um, he's just a servant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, it's hard. He's yeah. all family. Yeah. His dad uh, used to do a lot of maintenance in our work. His mum and grandma used to run the kids' church. Right. Beautiful family. Okay. There's yeah, lots he, of them. Is there? He's got a huge family, 12 yeah. or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's um, really involved in our music team. Yeah. She was. Um, he can play the piano, the guitar. Yeah, well, we had him, he was on the team, like, on Sunday he had guitar and swapping between the guitar yeah. and the piano. It was like playing it with a playing the piano with a guitar on his back. <laughs> it's like, it's like bon so what have you learned uh, in these years in, uh, you know, in church? From, what have I learned from you? Um, first thing I probably, my biggest takeaway of, so to, you've got to listen to God. Like, okay. that's the biggest thing, like, do what he says, who would have thought. <laughs> but you know, what I guess what I mean is like, um, I reckon we our biggest problem is ourselves like we we get in our own way the leaders people in general pastors. everybody yeah like and as a pastor yeah. yeah that was like um i'd say insecurity is a killer like you you mm-hmm. just when your filters anything's got to push your insecurity you not open to advice you don't yeah. ask enough people for help you yeah. try and make out like you know it all or you um, or if you're deluded enough or deceived enough, you think you know more yeah. than, you know. And um, so one of my biggest takeaways would be really like, like deal with insecurity, probably be yeah. the biggest thing. Like, and then when you're in that place, you just, you're fully open to advice. You're fully open to people speaking in. You can ask questions yeah. without that bravado. It's being vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. It's not being weak. It's being vulnerable. What do I, like, I just look at, I remember um, I was at one of the points where I was just like, <laughs> really just, where God's just chipping away, chipping away, chipping yeah. away. And I was at one of the, like, something happened and, like, I'm not someone that wants position. Yeah. Generally, because, but there was a particular thing that I really had my heart, and then someone really close to me got, and I was gutted. I'm just like, I wanted that. You know. That was mine. That's my inheritance. Yeah, basically, yeah, yes. And um, I was at the point where I was just... And then it wasn't like just that was it. It was just a whole bunch of stuff piled up. And then that was, you know, you talk about the straw that broke the camel's back. That was probably like the sack of bricks that broke the camel's back. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I remember I was like talking to uh, Pastor Malcolm, who's still my pastor. Like, yeah. We're, we're, he's still a, you know... Um, he preaches here once or twice a year. Yeah. Love him. Yeah, he's about the best person I know. Um, and I was saying to him, I was like, his office, like, you go in there, the door's always open. Sure. And then the door always stays open. Yes. You know? Yeah. But every now and again, I've been in there and I've closed the door. It's like, and he knows, it's like, what's going on? Yeah. I'm like, I was saying, I was like, how's this even fair? I'm like, y- you're old. Like, just it took you this long to get all this wisdom yeah it's like but you're gonna be dead soon give it to me like how come this like young people don't start like you know like how much better would life be yeah to start with the humility and wisdom that That you have (laughs) like yeah i'm just like we just go through life banging our heads against walls figuring it out dealing with our own stuff like you're just like how's this even fair like god like what on earth's god thinking to do design life this way and, um, but that would probably be my biggest takeaway for me personally yeah. and how much that had to do with you know the way of my upbringing would probably be a lot to do with it but I think it's pretty general is um, we like deal with your stuff like yeah. deal, deal with your stuff I'd say is, 
and then puts us in a better, best position where you can be to be a leader mm-hmm. for, to hear from God. And what I've found is that I, um, my biggest problem in being effective, we'll call it that, um, is running what God's saying to me through my own filter yeah. of what I want him to be saying. Yeah, <laughs> like, misinterpreting it. Yeah, like, you know, it's just like, or at times when he's saying to do things and you're just not brave enough. Yeah. Or at times he's saying not to do things, but... We still do it. Yeah, like, you know... And it doesn't go anywhere. No, you're, well, and even, um, even times where it's like, you know, you really understand Saul when he had all the people pressuring him to sacrifice, waiting for Samuel. Yeah. And then, so he just did it. Gives in. Yeah, and it's just like, ah. Oh, but if he had had that security, he wouldn't yeah. have done it. Um, so that's, yeah, like I'd say that's probably the biggest takeaway I've got is like, you know, pastors get healthy. Yeah. We're just a lot better for everybody. That's right. Yeah. Well, if, if the leader gets better, everybody gets better. Yeah, and it's obviously ongoing as well. Oh. We keep, you know, what's... What's the legacy you're building? What's the legacy we're building? Oh, that's a great question. What I hope... What I would love is that 100 years from now, Everyday Church is still going. Yeah. Like, I'd, I just would love it to be just still there, still people's lives getting changed, people getting healed, set free, born again. Yeah. Just 100 years from now. Now, Everyday Church, is it truly every day or you just meet on Sundays? Just Sundays. Just Sundays. <laughs> so you haven't even, you haven't got there yet? No. No, the, the, the vision with Everyday is... Um, not, not that would be an everyday attending. Sure. It's, no. it's like, leaving it out. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's for every, like everyday people, but it's also for people to be being the church. It's like we are the church. church Can you disrupt it from the Sunday? Could well, you? I, I think they're complementary. Yeah. Like, I think the Sunday is necessary. Yeah. Like I think a collection point. Yeah. Refueling, refiring. Um, you know, you're able to. Like, I think it's key. Yeah. But then I think, um, you know, you go to work on a Monday. But can you measure it? Is okay. it measurable, the Monday to Friday? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, maybe, like, the health of people? Like can they measure it? Can they see it? That it's real? That the vision is in their blood? That they have become everyday church? Because it's not something mm. that you do. Yeah, it's something yeah. they have to identify with that. Yeah, that's great. Great. Um, can people measure it? They will be able to shortly. <laughs> we'll find a way of quantifying it. Uh, yeah, I think. What What do you think? Like, how how would you have a way of sort of bringing that communicating? I or? I haven't thought about it. I'm just saying. I mean, if that's a vision, somehow we gotta we gotta check it. You know, we gotta yeah. verify that. It, you know, it's landing somewhere. Yeah, so I think like probably maybe some of the key aspects of it are mm-hmm. like um, the one of the things is it's for everyday people where people feel like they can just sure. be themselves because the the vision is very powerful. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I never thought of trying to make that make it measurable. And I'm not I'm not when I say measurable, I'm not talking about performance. No, no, but just as a way of some yeah. sort of metric are to we, actually gauge are we, it. Are we landing somewhere? Are we? Yeah. Uh, do we have traction? Is well, it actually yeah. happening, or we're we just talking about it? Yeah. Well, you know? I mean, I guess I, I'd probably have to say yes, and n- not so. And going away from this, we'll probably will try to me- like quantify it. But um, I have to say yes because we get testimonies, you know. Yeah, I think the stories will tell you that. Life, the yeah, yeah. So we do see testimonies. We do see fruit. So we okay, do see... we see testimony in their ministry. Yeah. No, no. I'm talking about people's lives. Do you yeah. see testimony in them? Yeah, from the from the congregation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that's that's where you want you want the DNA. Yeah. To be, you know, it's like I remember somebody asked me I don't know about ten years ago. They said to me, Nathaniel, do you still do missions? I said, not anymore. And they said, why not? I said, I don't do missions anymore. I am missions. Yeah. You know, before I used to do it, now I am it. Yeah. You know, I identify with, with that. Yeah. It's no longer something that I do. It's something that I am now. Yeah. And I think, you know, if we can get out people, it's like in, in your case as well, for them to be everyday church, mm. it's far greater than to do everyday church. Yeah. Because that means that message becomes part mm. of them. And, they don't think about doing it. 
So I don't go to everyday church. I am everyday church. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's beautiful. It is, it is well, beautiful. Because what you're doing here, it's, you're not, so what you have begun, not that it hasn't, done be- hasn't been done before. What I love about this is that you've begun something that can be done whether they go to another church or not. Yeah. It's a, it's a movement. It's, a, it's an invitation into being everyday Christian, a practicing Christian every day. <laughs> so it's not just to your church. Yeah. The beauty of this, of your legacy, yeah. it's a lot wider than that. It's yeah. an invitation for people. This is how we're doing it. Why don't you come on board? Still go to your local church on Sunday. Yeah. But grab the idea yeah. of being the everyday, everyday church. Yeah, wow. That's cool. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Now, you, you wrote a couple of books. Yeah. The first one is Kids at War, The Battle of Addiction. Yeah. So I just found out that's actually a bestseller. Okay. And I didn't realize that. I wow. I was talking with a publisher a couple of weeks ago and they're like, you, you realize that you should be putting giant... I'm like, oh, okay. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So who published this for you? I oh, know self-published. Oh, you self-published. Yeah. Okay, you're great. Both well of them done. self-published. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. Well, this is this is great, and I'm, I look forward to reading it. So this is this has to do with uh, your story, yeah. This kind is of addiction, basically my testimony. Okay. So well, now you've heard the shorter version, obviously, yeah. but you can get this book. Uh, you have a website, jacobhill.com. dot uh, org. dot org. dot au yeah. or dot org. Just dot org. Jacob Hill double L dot org. Yeah. And then you have this latest one, which is Living Today on Purpose, a guide for daily victory. So this is a devotional. It's a daily devotional. Everyday yep. church. Every day. <laughs> well, yeah. see, this is what I mean. Yeah. You you were writing the book before probably Everyday Church began. Yeah, before the name began, before we changed yeah. the name, yeah. But see, this, this seed was in you. Yeah. Because this is Everyday Church. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is helping people live every day. That vision. Yeah, that's cool. So, you know, you probably didn't even realize, but... No, the no, first time that penny's dropped. Um, so, well, 365 devotionals, eh? Yeah. Or 366? 365. Okay. Get a day off on the... Uh, Leap year. F- February 29. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll read 28 again. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Look, this is a massive, massive achievement, Jacob. And, uh, you know... Credit to you and Melissa for you know leading a church and also giving something to the people that they can read every day and be connected with the Father. That's cool. Well, um, grab this wherever you are, JacobHill.org, and uh, yeah, make sure you read it every day because you will become the everyday church wherever you are. Yeah. Jacob, thank you so much for coming at Kingdom Stories from Down Under, yeah. and. Uh, Love this interview. Love the time we spent together. Absolute pleasure. And I'm sure we've blessed so many people out there. Thanks so much for having me. Well, what a story, eh? Now, as as I said at the beginning of this uh, podcast, this video show, uh, most people would not have given Jacob a chance. You know, when you're deep in addiction, you don't get many opportunities to come out. In fact, most people don't come out. I remember once uh, somebody saying to me that he doesn't know anybody who has come out of addiction without Jesus and stayed out of addiction. So the answer to, if you have friends, if you have uh, relatives, maybe even sons, daughters, or parents who are in addiction, brothers and sisters, just know that the answer is Jesus. And uh, rehab centers like Teen Challenge and other organizations that are out there, they bring people to the Lord. And the Lord does the miracle of changing lives. It is possible. The impossible becomes possible when Jesus comes in. And this is a powerful testimony. And I'm going to call this, um, this episode Everyday Church because I just love it so much. And I pray that you are the everyday church out there and you are inspired by this story. And take this book, Living Today on Purpose, and do exactly that. Live every day on purpose. And may the Lord bless you. Do share this content wherever you are watching this or listening to this and let other people be blessed by these beautiful stories that we share here at Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.